Welcome to our panel on Voicing Democracy, Reclaiming Citizenship, the Role of Women's Political Activism in India. I'm Minakshi, and with me are my colleagues and co-travelers, all feminist professors, Krishna Menon, Hi. Rukmani Sen, Hello. Niharika Banerjee. Hi. And in typical feminist form, we decided to have a conversation rather than a presentation on the issues at stake. Our starting point is Shaheen Bagh, a Muslim neighborhood in the capital city of Delhi in India that has been the epicenter of an unprecedented protest, an unbroken continuous sit-in for over 70 days of citizens with Muslim women coming out in large numbers against the Citizenship Amendment Act adopted with the huge majority by the National Parliament in December of 2019. And also the National Register of Citizens and the Notified National Population Register seem to be on the anvil and perceived, rightly or wrongly, to be hugely discriminatory against the Muslims and some marginalized groups. The CAA, or the Citizen Amendment Act, is also perceived and presented by sections of the population as violating the spirit of the Indian Constitution adopted in 1950 as a sovereign democratic republic with the preamble adding the word secular to distinguish it from a theocracy in 1976. The government, however, has refuted these claims and fears and with the counterclaim that the CAA is only intended to grant citizenship to migrants, read persecuted minorities of Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Christian and Parsi communities who came to the country from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan on or before December 31st, 2014. Clearly, the Muslims of all sects have been kept out of this particular dispensation. Just to remind us all, India has 11% of the world's Muslim population, around 16% of the Indian population, that is 226 million, am I right? or over of the one over 1 billion population are Muslim in India. Interestingly, the Supreme Court of India has refused to order a stay on its implementation, which has been requested by about 143 petitioners and has granted the government time to come up with a response. It has also restrained other courts the High Courts, for example, from hearing pleas against this, against the CAA, till, the, till it arrives at a decision on how to take it forward. Shaheen Bagh has captured the imagination of the youth in India and of women's groups in particular. India is still a young country. 50% of its population is below the age of 25 and 65% below 35 years of age. The people that converge here every day in large numbers are young and are young women primarily. Shaheen Bagh evokes memories of earlier resistances that the world has witnessed or known. US campuses against the Vietnam War, Occupy Wall Street, Tiananmen Square, Kent State University, Tahrir Square, the student uprising in Paris in the 60s, closer home to the US, the Montgomery March, and Nashville, Tennessee. But this was all that and a bit more. It resonates with the Greenham Commons, the Women in Black, the Madre de la Mau, the Plaza in Argentina, the Wajir Group in Kenya, the White Scarf Movement in Armenia. And yet it is still very different. Thousands of women, mostly Muslim, across age, class, caste, and even religion, many in hijabs, crossing several boundaries, breaking several barriers, 
some even stepping out of conservative homes and conventional customs and taboos for the first time in a civil disobedience vigil to uphold the values of equality and freedoms enshrined in Articles 15 and 19 of the Indian Constitution. Standing up, standing up to the might of the state, to bullying, to barricades, and even bullets, as Krishna has said, in a non-sectarian, non-denominational show of solidarity, to not the legality of the Constitution, but the justice enshrined in living the constitutional idea of citizenship. So many of the placards that these women use say, don't be silent, but don't be violent. For years preceding this, women have fought the smaller battles at home. But as women from all classes and creeds occupy streets one consi once considered unsafe, as their thunderous, peaceful presence and their transversal solidarities bolster the movement against exclusions and marginalization, and as they voice democracy on issues that are not considered women's issues or minority issues, not Muslim-specific issues, even as they face iron rods, the threat of summary arrest, they expand the notion of what it means to be a citizen, as T.H. Green had once said, the intelligent patriot. They signal a new beginning for the women's movements, reclaiming its mandate to, spark, to speak on behalf of all citizens, rejecting marginality, rejecting ghettoization, and rejecting reductionism. Yeah. Shaheen Bagh has become a metaphor of the possibilities of feminist praxis, a metonym for a woman's place is in the resistance and hers is the street. Women are not in the lines. Here they are the front line. And these are women who have come out of the shadows of invisibility and silence. And the battles are not just on state borders, they are everywhere. So what is new and different about this moment? Or is it only a flash in the pan? destined to preside over its own demise, like the Paris Commune of 1871. The women's movements in India post-independence from colonial rule have taken on board a host of issues to mobilize an effective front against entrenched patriarchy. Predictably, there have been twists and turns, some triumphs, some setbacks, from the anti-price rise movements in the 60s to the participation in labor strikes, mm -hmm to issues of dowry, domestic violence, unequal wages, reproductive rights, religious diktats, through discriminatory laws on marriage, divorce, inheritance and property and rape and sexual assault, sexual harassment at the workplace, and the women's movements have called out patriarchy and pushed for major reform in legislation. Yet the battle against cultures of misogyny and impunity have had mixed successes so too against cultures of silence. Krishna Menon will speak to that in a bit. The women have also used different forms of mobilization and consciousness raising, but this moment pushes the envelope much further, and we hope its new cadences and contours will reveal themselves as we move ahead. Are these women, in attempting to live the constitution, at excavating and moving beyond legality to justice? Are they doing feminist politics? If so, what are its manifestations? Do they, do they believe that they are feminist? Do they know the Western notions of feminism? Or have they schooled through a different sensibility, a different route? They are braving the cold, keeping vigil, bringing artifacts of the domestic sphere into the public space, reaching boundaries, mm. and although they are unschooled in the theory of the personal is a political or that biology is not destiny, and yet demonstrating enormous sagacity and restraint and bringing a kind of camaraderie through music, poetry, theater, shared food into a celebration of democracy in the reclaiming of citizenship to eschew the politics of stereotyping, hate, and polarization. So over to my colleagues, Krishna,
Would you like to come in here and locate this very special moment, this contemporary moment, in a global national context of feminist politics? Thank you, uh, Dr. Gopinath. We couldn't have hoped for a better opening. Um, you set the tone for the discussion so very uh, beautifully. Uh, of course, your words are eloquent, but I think uh, what is going on in Shaheen Bagh and places like Shaheen Bagh that have uh, emerged across uh, Indian uh, cities and towns is in itself so beautiful, so empowering. Uh, it's giving us teachers in the academy, uh, in the university, a new way of looking at the theories that we have learned. So I think that as teachers, as uh, academics, as scholars, for us, the Shaheen moment, if I might call it that, is the moment when we've actually understood when we, when we use the word praxis, it's the Shaheen moment which has at least for me, I've understood how theory and practice are actually enmeshed and go together. So what I teach in class is actually coming from Shaheen Bagh. And I take my understanding of feminist politics to Shaheen Bagh when I engage with the uh, women there. So the word Shaheen, interestingly, is of Persian origin. And of course, it means literally the falcon and the falcon soars high, but it also means royal. Uh, but Shaheen Bagh today is anything but royal in the conventional sense. It's the altar of democracy in, in, a, um, in a manner of speaking. Uh, this is where new knowledge is being created, even as we are speaking. So that's very sign significant for us as teachers. It's reconfiguring both the private and the public. It's reconfiguring the private when, mm -hmm. as you said, Dr. Gopinath, these women, many of them have never stepped out of their homes. They've never been separated from their children. Care work was 24-7 their responsibility. This unpaid work that women did, they have in a way taken that work of caring to the streets now. They care for India. They care for the idea of India. So the care that was till now focused on their children and families is now being extended to the idea of India and to the idea of citizenship. Who is an Indian citizen? It has to be nurtured and cared for. And these women in Shaheen Bagh are showing us how to do that. And they're reconfiguring the public for many of these women to be out on the streets unaccompanied by the men of their families was unthinkable. And now these women have actually made, they've been there for 70 days, over 70 days. So clearly they have been talking, chatting, singing songs together, exchanging recipes, caring for each other's children, chopping vegetables for each other's kitchen. That's the kind of bonds that have developed in Shaheen Bagh. So while doing this, they are reconfiguring the public space as well. So it's not just the private. So when you spoke about the personal being, the political, I think these women are showing us on a daily basis. It's a daily lesson in feminist politics that we are learning from uh, Shaheen Bagh. I think the presence of... Uh, Muslim women in large numbers is yet another very significant uh, aspect of these sit-ins. I'll come to that later and uh, maybe uh, Rukmini or Niharika would like to come yes. in here. Yeah. So the, the trigger for this outpouring is really the, the CAA. Uh, so what, from a feminist perspective, Rukmini, what would be the critique of the legal frameworks and the couching of the CA, its inclusions and its exclusions. Yeah. So I would think that even to get to the Citizenship Amendment Act, one needs to walk it through the protest site of Shaheen Bagh because it is redefining the meaning of citizenship and redefining the everyday meaning of citizenship. The, the image that Shaheen Bagh evokes is that of a pulsating space of and for democracy. A democracy which is imagined by women of all ages 
a space that is a conglomeration of people of different communities. There is a multiplicity of colors in that space, green, saffron, blue, and red. And there is also a coexistence of Gandhi, Ambedkar, Nehru, Azad, Savitri, Bai, Phule in the images of the political leaders that find a space there. And one would want to get into the legalities of the Citizenship Act, keeping this as a background as what Shaheen Bagh is showing us in terms of democracy, citizenship and freedom. The Citizenship Act of India came for the first time in 1955, passed by the Indian Parliament. It was one of the first few legislations that the sovereign Indian Parliament had enacted with the objective of providing for the acquisition and determination of Indian citizenship. The terms nationality and citizenship however, could not be used interchangeably. And this came later through a Supreme Court judgment in 1963. The ways through which citizenship can be determined in India as per the 1955 Act were the following. One, by birth. Two, by descent. Three, by registration. And four, by naturalization. There has been a subsequent amendment to the Citizenship Act, which came in 2003, when the clause attached to citizenship by birth got connected with proving, one, both the parents had to be citizens of India, and two, one of whose parents is a citizen of India, while the other is not an illegal migrant at the time of birth. So there is a definition of illegal migrant that comes into the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2003. An illegal migrant gets defined for the first time as a foreigner who enters India without a valid passport or travel document. So you see the connection between documents, do need for documentation, and the way documents will prove citizenship that comes through the illegal migrant definition. One of the main additions that has come in this round of amendment in 2019, which you already mentioned in your uh, you know, opening remarks, it brings in a connection between religion and citizen. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, we see that provided any person belonging to Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Jain, Parsi, or Christian community from very specific locations of Afghanistan, Bangladesh, or Pakistan, who entered into India on or before 31st of December 2014 shall not be treated as an illegal migrant. So this clearly leaves out Muslims, but at the same point of time, it also does not include Hindus or Buddhists, say, of Sri Lanka. So it is probably not a blanket refuge that is being given to minorities from any part of South Asia. And in an interesting way through these amendments, South Asian histories are also coming together and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with, with um, all, all of these being post-colonial nation sh states, there are shared, you know, pasts and also shared presence clearly. In terms of a feminist engagement, anxiety with this linking of kinship and religion, which has got connected with the acquiring of citizenship. I think what I would like to do, I would like to talk about the feminist engagement around the emphasis on and yet the unclarity about documents that will be needed as evidence. I want to talk about it through some of the posters that we've seen women use at Shahinbagh or at other protest sites, which voices the anxiety. So one poster reads like this. I have to run away from my natal family to get married. How do I get documents to prove my citizenship? This is a really valid concern for women. Questions of marriage, questions of consent and questions of citizenship. And another one. How many women have property on their names? How can we show 
tenancy documents to prove citizenship. So linking property, kinship, document, citizenship. So these, continuing with, with what Krishna said, these are redefining the way in which citizenship is imagined. And these are actually coming from these protest sites by these women, which is also giving us a new imagination of gender and citizenship. And I think there's also this simultaneous protest against the culture of certification by the nation state. So coming to you, Niharika, how, how would you look at this whole issue uh, of this matter of certification and anxieties uh, through using a queer critique of the idea of citizenship and marginalization and exclusion? Thank you, uh, uh, Minakshi, for that. And um, thank you to both of you as well. And thank you all of you out there for listening to us. Um, so uh, I would also, you know, uh, connect with uh, uh, both, you know, all of my colleagues here and set the tone with some of the sights and sounds that one sees in Shaheen Bagh and then connect those sights and sounds to the larger question of anxiety and citizenship and so on. So it's very interesting that one of the things that we see there, that even though there is a concern for citizenship, but there is also a disassociation from any kind of political party. Uh, in other words, this place is truly a dream for being and acting out as a citizen, where you are there as, you know, a person of different kinds of social locations, but yet you're not attached to a political party. Isn't that a dream come true almost? So, um, so you know, uh, once one, if we go there, we see that, of course, you know, even if you are affiliated to a political party, you can speak there, but the space itself is autonomous from any kind of political party affiliation, but yet it is extremely political. You know, so while the personal is made political, the political also is made very personal here in this space. And it's a lovely place to be a citizen, but a very, uh, um, you know, important space. Now, um, you know, coming to the question of the uh, NPR, the NRC, and its uh, uh, conjunction with the CAA, um, there are, uh, continuing from what Rukmini was just saying, that there is uh, a real material fear about disenfranchisement. And this is really, um, you know, um, tied to the explicit requirement as uh, Rukmini was talking about to the population register that those enumerated have to declare with documents their last place of residence, the date and place of parents. So the two key documents that are crucial for this exercise are land deeds and birth certificates. Um, I'll talk, you know, uh, a little bit about uh, the queer critiques of uh, this kind of anxiety that uh, we were just talking about. And uh, as we, you know, know that from the queer perspective, sexuality has been a very value loaded uh, political project and object. And until recently, at the national level, queer politics in India had been concentrating on the question of decriminalization because of the anti-sodomy law, section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, which was read down on 6th September 2018. Now, you know, within these uh, particular protests around the CA, NPR and NRC, we see a huge participation from queer persons across the country and there are two emerging key points in the queer critique against you know the combined effects of CA, NPR and NRC. One that is a, it has an immediate impact on transgender persons and this is because it is impossible for the majority of transgender persons to prove their lineage. Uh, a large majority of trans persons are disconnected from their families and many have genders, names, even religions that are different mm -hmm. from those that uh, have been assigned in their birth certificates, resulting in discrepancies in documented proof <laughs> of citizenship. Um, and uh, therefore, you know, the discriminatory, this legislation is considered discriminatory uh, on this ground. Um, and 
already what uh, the research shows that the discriminatory effects of the population register is a reality for about 2,000 trans persons who have been excluded from the NRC in Assam, which mm -hmm. Arukmini will talk about in a bit. And the second point that one sees is about the subject that articulates the critique. Queer bodies, when on the streets, um, you know, including mine, protesting, are present as queer, as trans, as LGBT. And the combined exclusionary logic of the CAA, NPR, NRC are pushing Muslims, Dalits, Adivasis, and the landless into terrains of further abuse. Uh, that is the you know concern and anxiety, and queer bodies are visibilizing themselves through new alliances at both a discursive level and material level. Um, and um, you know, in other words, one of the queer critiques is that you know if if uh, dissident bodies that have emerged in public discourse through recent legal recognition are now descending against uh, you know on the streets against what is considered a certain exclusionary policies for both queer and other marginalized mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, groups. Right. So much of the, uh, the uh, dissent is around issues of how you belong, where you belong, notions of belonging, and not just of nationality and nationhood. Mm -hmm. So in this whole uh, plethora of mobilizational, new mobilization methodologies, uh, how would you sort of look at uh, the leadership uh, question in terms of mobilizing uh, around feminist principles? How, what kind of a leadership model, if at all, does this uh, represent? I think uh, that's a very uh, pertinent question with reference to the Shaheen Bagh um, story that's unfolding even as we are speaking with each other. Uh, the fact is that, uh, you know, the congregation of so many women at Shaheen Bagh has come as a bit of a surprise to some. But I think uh, feminist uh, activists and scholars have always known, uh, and it's, a, it's an open secret, that women have always been political, but in their own ways. Mm -hmm. And women have always participated in politics, both in leadership as well as at the grassroots. But it's the combined uh, force of multiple levels of patriarchies and misogyny that succeeds in invisibilizing the political labor that uh, women put in. So to take us back a bit into say the pre-independence movement, the pre-1947, women were part of the Gandhian uh, movement, of course, in very big numbers, but they were part of the socialist uh, movement. They were part of the communist, the fledgling communist parties that were uh, active in the pre-independence period. But we don't really find history, uh, accounts of history, recording them. It's only now that feminist historiography has begun to recover these women. Mm -hmm. So much so that, you know, Rukmini and I often speak about the 15 marvelous women who were part of the constituent assembly Same. that uh, framed this constitution. Uh, so in a way, the women at Shaheen Bagh are perhaps granddaughters or daughters of those 15 women who were in the Constituent Assembly. So the political labor that women have put in um, has really not been acknowledged. If at all, they are, you know, uh, typically when women take part in political movements, newspaper reports often prefix the word even and say, even women were mm -hmm. out on the streets. But now it's not uh, any longer possible to say that. In fact, one has to say even men are at Shaheen Bagh, you know. So that's really a very interesting facet about leadership. As also the fact that these women are, to go back to my theme of reconfiguration, they're reconfiguring the idea of leadership itself. It's everybody's movement. Everybody is a participant. So like Niharika said, this is not a space for party politics, 
but it's a political space for everybody who subscribes to the egalitarian ideas of citizenship. And that's what makes participation by women here very significant. But there's something else which is really striking about the fact that here are Muslim women, many of them wearing a hijab. So hijab clad Muslim women the world over, especially post 9-11 world, they uh, arouse feelings of contempt, suspicion, discomfort. But here at Shaheen Bagh, they are there. They are wearing their Muslimness very lightly. They are not there to protest as Muslim women. They are there to protest for the universal value. So they, they embody a specific identity, but they are asking for universal principles. So this constant tension mm -hmm. between specific embodiment on the one hand and the clarion call for universal values of freedom, democracy, citizenship, I think that's what is actually befuddling scholars and uh, activists. How do you deal with this? Because you can understand if Muslim women wearing hijab are out on the streets to protest for uh, Islamic values or for the Sharia law. But what do you do with Muslim women who are there mm -hmm. not asking for themselves or their religion, but for the universal values of liberty, equality, justice, fraternity, Eternity, dignity, the core values of the Indian preamble, as uh, Rukmini uh, mentioned just a little while ago. It's also very fascinating because these women, because there are no leaders here, there is no adversary either. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different kind of a political movement. It's actually invoking, so it's a conversation between morally right and morally not so right. There are no binaries mm -hmm. here. And I think that's, again, a very attractive moment for us who are observing this movement as it is unfolding. But uh, I don't want to make it look like an exceptional moment, actually, mm -hmm. because uh, over the last, say, 20 odd years, across the global south, Muslim women have actually been stepping out of the prescribed roles for them the roles prescribed for them by their community, which is to embody Muslimness. They're trying to step out of that and claim the uh, secular democratic space. So in India itself, I think uh, there is there are at least two big groups, the Bebak Collective and the Bharatiya Muslim Mahila Andolan. Uh, they're very different. They don't agree on most things. But yet, mm -hmm. the fact is that in both these groups, you have Muslim women who are unapologetic about being Muslim and at the same time are asking for uh, constitutional values of democracy, freedom. So I have many more things to say, but I think we'll listen to what Rukmini has to say. Just the important thing is that the constitution matters. Mm -hmm. and But how does it matter and to whom does it matter? That's is it, you know, how do you snatch it from mm -hmm. uh, elite bastions and bring it into the heat and dust of subaltern expectations and aspirations? I think that's what this whole movement is really about. You spoke about the four mothers of the constitution, mm -hmm. 15 out of 389 of the constituent assembly. And one of them actually got the UN Human Rights Declaration yeah. language changed mm -hmm. uh, to talk about men and women mm -hmm. as being uh, you know, uh, I've been able to access universal human rights. But Rukmini, for to, for you, yeah. Uh, so to just carry on with the importance attached to the living document of the Constitution and to connect it with uh, Krishna's point on reconfiguration of leadership. Uh, one of the things that we are seeing and witnessing at Shaheen Bagh is that Shaheen Bagh doesn't seem to be an event. It represents an everyday, if we have to make a classic, uh, you know, anthropological distinction between an event and an everyday, which is the reason why also it may not be about leaders, but about collectives, not about speeches being delivered, but about dialogues being uh, shared, about care and support, about sharing of food, about accommodation of space. 
and not really about masculine promises for tomorrow. So it's uh, it's it's definitely uh, doing a different kind of politics. It is a living democracy, and that is probably one of the reasons why one of the sounds, as if from Shaheen Bagh, has been Samvidhan Zindabad, long live the constitution. So, and this seems a very interesting spin-off to the otherwise common in Kalab Zindabad or long live the revolution that most protest marchers would <laughs> chant. Uh, but reclaiming the constitution, the collective reading of the preamble to the Indian constitution, more so in multiple Indian languages, which has these principles of liberty, equality, fraternity, justice, dignity, enshrined have brought the constitution as if to the streets. Uh, it's become the word Samvidhan has become the most popular word in the Oxford di Hindi dictionary of 2019. So these words that are enshrined in the preamble, they are being claimed, they are being understood, they are being articulated, and they are also being demanded in the everyday lives of these women from and of Shahimbag. So the constitution has ceased to be a book, a legal text only to be engaged by legal scholars in the country or to be done uh, through legalese in the Supreme Court or the other high courts. It has become a living document which has relevance in the everyday lives of the people of this country. We, the people of India, the first three wor few words of the Indian constitution has become extremely significant. And at this critical juncture, when women of all ages and communities and people together are reading it, it has become another kind of a reverberation, as if the melody of our times, we, the people of India. That's fabulous, so well put. You spoke about di <clears throat> dialogic spaces. <clears throat> you also spoke, spoke about shrinking spaces. Now, Shaheen Bagh abets a central university, abuts, sorry, abuts a central university. There's been violence on that campus. It's primarily a Muslim university. There's been violence on the Jawaharlal Nehru University campus. Does Shaheen Bagh now represent a learning commons, mm -hmm. the extended university, where a kind of experiment in dialogue and multi-logs is being carried out? Would anyone like to comment on that? <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, there's no doubt that Shaheen Bag, and I think uh, you'd agree with me, uh, is really an extension of our classrooms. And some of us would like to imagine that our classrooms are an extension of Shaheen Bag. And uh, that's the way the dialogue is actually um, being nourished. So students attend class in the morning, in the afternoon, they are at Shaheen Bagh, only to come back next day to class and share with their peers what they saw, what they heard, what implications does it have for the feminist theory that they are studying in class. I think the presence of young women, so uh, as Rukmini said, women across age groups, caste, community are participating in it. But one very uh, outstanding feature of this is the uh, presence of young people, especially young women. And this cannot be disregarded. In a country where simply stepping out of the homes for young women is difficult. You know, they need to take permissions, they need to offer explanations. There's an elaborate system of monitoring and surveillance uh, that accompanies these outings. In such a context, these young women are out, they've crossed that proverbial line, they're out there on the streets at night, unaccompanied by family. I think they are breaking many conventions while they are doing that. And they're challenging that line that separates the so-called good woman from the characterless one. And the characterless one is somebody who roams freely on the streets laughs loudly mm -hmm. and has strong political opinions 
all of these things these young women so, at Shaheen Bagh are guilty of. You know, <laughs> they're of course laughing uproariously, they're walking <laughs> freely, and they do have extremely strong political opinions based on their engagement with the constitution. So I think a new crop of women. And it's very important for us to remember that 47% of enrollment in higher education institutions today is women students. These women have been able to make a connection between the daily misogyny that they experience in their lives and the Citizenship Amendment Act and the assumptions that it makes about belonging, like both of you were uh, drawing our attention to. For most Indian women, if you ask them the question that Dr. Gopinath asked, where do you belong to? Do they belong to their parents' family or do they belong to their husband's families? In fact, in Assam, many women found that they uh, lost their claims to citizenship because when lineage has had to be established, they gave their husband's family as, you know, to trace their lineage. And that was discounted by the bureaucracy that was scrutinizing the papers. So between convention, between legal arrangements, between the fact that these women do not have the autonomy to go to the center where you need to present yourself each individual has to present herself. They don't have the permission from their families. All of these factors are, I think, making it very evident to the women in Shaheen Bagh why they should be on the streets, why they must step out of their homes. I think they figured out governmentality much better than classes on governmentality in the university can. They've understood that this process of classification, categorization, segregation will lead to management, monitoring and surveillance of uh, them and their people. And I think that they've got that connection. You're right. When you speak about governmentality, it's, it's the state of uh, exception that has somehow become the norm of governance. And so they are, in some senses, singing in dark times because through their song, they're actually uh, resisting erasure and they're seeking to make uh, sort of language uh, uh, speak uh, rather than become uniform, flat and banal, which is what post-truth societies <laughs> tend to do. So, would you like to come in here, Rukhne? Uh, just on that uh, note on singing together and creating maybe a new language through singing, one of the continuous uh, songs uh, um, starts with these two words, hum dekhenge, which means we will see. And it is inevitable, as the song goes, it is inevitable that we too shall see. The day has been promised, that has been written in the book of destiny, we too shall see. That's how the song goes when translated in English. Interestingly, this Nazam or this song was originally written by Faiz Ahmed Faiz in the context of an oppressive regime in Pakistan in the 1970s. And that is being sung and reclaimed by peace protesters here at Shaheen Bagh. So the overwhelming presence of this song again indicates shared histories of cultural activism across South Asia, using their poems, songs, music in different moments of post-colonial South Asian histories. And this song also seems to be used to counter the hegemonic narrative that the country is watching through television about who are the protesters. So we, we will also see this as a peaceful, melodious counter to a certain kind of dominant narrative that is coming out. Uh, and one actually might want to think of, of some kind of a conversation that is happening between we, the people of India, and we will also see. Great. And I think they're also reconfiguring the notion of safe spaces for women and talking about brave spaces because they're out there defending their male colleagues who may have been hit by the bayonets and the rods of, of, the, of uh, an opposing force, uh, which seems to be at this point of time an overwhelmingly uh, strong 
force that needs to be uh, interrogated. So just to sum up very, very quickly, uh, what, what are the lessons, what are the takeaways? I think Shaheen Bagh has demonstrated that stepping out, transgressing, and calling out patriarchy does not have to be sequential. It can be simultaneous. And that minorities can speak on behalf of the majority, transcend ghettoization, that the emphasis on tra constitutionalism can help resist framing people into stereotypical notions of oppositional identities, that going beyond vote bank politics to create a discourse of inclusion is important and that women can do it because the cynicism of party lobbies uh, can be resisted and that the symbolic repertoire is important. It must reflect what is of constitutional value and assert its importance as a moral document embodying an eth ethical edifying vision. So just to just to think about the poem or, poet, or poetry as being sort of the impulse of this, does Shaheen Bagh say the following to all of us? It says, the center, and I quote, uh, the center is alive, peopled, and busy, not a fixed point at all. It is where we stand and from where we reach out. It is where roads converge <clears throat> and from where roads branch out. It is a place of all seasons, summer, winter, storm, and healing rain, where the dry earth is watered and where forgiveness thaws the ice of the heart. Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Such a stimulating. And all of you for listening. Thank you. And all of you, you very much. much.